just carried a, a bale, so I am I am covered in oxide daisy. Um, oh, that's corn chamomile. I've got a little bit of a um, little bit of uh, cornflower going on over here. If you have a copy of this and there isn't a bit of blood on the page, then you haven't done it right. handbook. <laughs> <laughs> One thing to, that everybody, every gardener has to bear, bear in mind is the fact that, you know, you have to go with your gut feeling. And if a plant speaks to you, nine times out of ten it will do all right because they are nothing if not adaptable. It's so smart, it's very Parisian. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh la la. <laughs> Ooh la la. Hello, welcome to the seventh episode of Talking Dirty, Get Gardening's podcast, especially for plant lovers. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, we have Ellen, Ellen, Alan, Edward, Herbert Gray, our happy, handsome horticulturalist. <laughs> Down in Cambridge, we have Thordis Maria, Sophia Friedrichsen. Um, we, and, we've, we've both got a couple of, hand, you know, full mouthfuls of names. Well, we? we have. We have uh, a, a mouthful uh, of a name and um, uh, hiding uh, behind uh, a piece of paper because we can't work out how to make her into a mystery box is this week's mystery guest. So, the big reveal. Oh, and you've got to compliment or to counterbalance your amazing names. My name, full name, is Bunny Guinness. We don't waste time on names in our family. <laughs> but it's not my real name, of course, but I've always been called Bunny. And uh, because when I was born, it was a long, painful birth. And I came out with two black eyes. And my father said, she looks just like a current bun. And so I was called Bunny from then on. I thought it was Bunny Rabbit. Well, my sister always says that as a joke. Saying, oh, we all know why you're called Bunny, because you're you know, like a rabbit. But that's not true at all. It started off when I was a few days old. Oh, <laughs> I never knew that. So do you really hate your christened name? Yes. And I was never called it. You see, they always wanted a boy. And my father was called Peter. So you can guess what they called me. <laughs> can you believe it? What parents do to their children? <laughs> So, uh, but I've never called it, thank God, because the bun bunny stuck. Well, Bunny oh, Guinness, I'm fairly certain everyone will know who you are. You're broadcaster, writer, fabulous designer. But just in case there's, you know, a person watching or listening to this who doesn't know about you, can we have a kind of potted history? Well, I'm technically a landscape architect um, and they are a bit different from garden designers. And so I've been doing this for about 50 odd years. I started off with a horticultural degree at Reading University, then when I went on to do landscape architecture diploma, and I worked for various companies for various years, and then I set up on my own maybe 35 years ago, something like that, and now I work with my daughter who's also a landscape architect called Unity, but she has an arts background, and then she did the landscape qualification, so it's quite nice, and I come from the planty side and she comes from the arty side. But it's lovely working with your daughter. Lovely for me, not not always so lovely for her, I don't think. <laughs> the great thing is, Bunny, that you have somebody to play bat and ball with so you can refine your ideas. Exactly. I remember and when we go, it. yeah, and when we go and do a day consultation, because we do it as a form of a day consultation, so the client gets a survey and we both go, and the client and their partner has to be there, and we spend the day thrashing it out. And that is, as you say, because in a garden design, you could do a million things or more yeah. with the garden, and you want to explore all the possibilities with a client who knows what they like and not like. And when they've got something to criticise, they find it much easier to decide what they like. And so we exactly. draw all sorts of permutations and it's, it's a fun way to do it. I would love to work with my mum more. It must be a really nice way to spend kind of quality time. Does it ever kind of go awry? Do you ever get really sort of incompatible? Oh yes, yes. Yeah, because we are very different people. And um, she's much more like my husband. And um, so we do. But what is nice is when it's with family, you can vent all. <laughs> if I said what I said to my daughter and vice versa to an employee or employer, we'd be fired, you know, we'd be out. But because it's family, it can all combust and then it quickly comes back down. But I think that's probably quite healthy. No whole bars <laughs> sort of approach, well, really. That's what you always... Family. 
That's what we always say about Graham. It's why the garden is so exciting, is that you do play band ball and have that, that exchange of ideas. There's, there's, a, there's a coat of arms of Manchester in our garden, which we've used as a decorative ornament. Above, above the, the gate? Coast. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. And the the motto, Consilio et Labore, be, main, means very basically by council and by labour. And I always tell everybody that it's that applies to Graham and I. It's argument and damned hard work because that's how the garden was made. And we do have yeah. debates, and some of those de debates can sound quite ferocious, shall we say? Yeah. But I mean, yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right, about that, Bunny, because you thrash it out, and then it's just the decision is made. Yeah, I, I always wonder how these designers go to a garden, do it, and come back with the mm. plan. I mean, the client must have things they had wouldn't want and and it must it's so difficult that way but to thrash it out on the spot is is fabulous i think yeah i love a good thrash out yeah <laughs> <laughs> and of course when people hire you bunny um to to come with your daughter and, and design their garden i think what's what's great is that you really are a plants woman you really are all about the plants well i'm not to the extent i would say that alan is although i did the horticulture degree um, and I have got a fairly extensive garden here. I never feel I know a plant until I've grown it, which I think is pathetic, but I, I don't feel at home with it until I have. And, um, uh, and I think and when I was working for commercial firms, obviously you, you tend not to major on the plant so much when I was doing big commercial schemes like roof gardens up city centers and all that sort of stuff. Um, then, then I think you lose a little bit of it. But obviously, I keep up with my gardening, and, and gardeners' question time, you know, makes you keep up to speed with new introductions and things a bit. So yeah, but uh, I wouldn't call. I would never really call myself a plants woman. I love my plants. I'm not not like there are brilliant plants people around, aren't there? That Alan's pretty good, aren't you? It's aren't funny you? though, because I think most plants people who I would consider to be plants people don't consider themselves to be because with gardening, there is always so much to learn. And you're right, you yeah. kind of, yeah. you do probably need to have grown it to really know it. Um, yeah. And of course, Alan, you've got such opportunity, I suppose, to experiment in your garden. And, um, and maybe that's, uh, that's part of the, the key. I think it is. And it's also an inquisitive mind, I think. Because um, it, it's it, and it's about acquisition of various plants. I mean, we have we're talking on here about Flomo, or will be shortly. Mm. And and there's also the association of plants. You see, and I there's two plants that I associate with Bunny Guinness because I think it's a couple of years ago maybe we we did a um, a gardener's question time down at the, one of the Cambridge colleges, and she very kindly brought bought me some um, lovely creamy coloured salvias. Do you remember? Oh, that I thought were Woolerton Old Hall. Yes, but they weren't. Were they, or were they? I think it was clotted cream. Oh, clotted cream, yeah, because I meant to bring you Woolerton Old Hall, which is a sport of Sarah Potosi, which is yeah. fantastic, a white sport, yeah. yeah. But you brought me oh, clotted right. cream, and the other plant yeah. I associate with you is from one of your show gardens at the Chelsea Flower Show, and um, we, were we were lucky enough to be there on press day, and we um, got, I, well, I got to come around your garden, but only if I took my shoes off. Oh, um, yes, I'm very strict. Judged. <laughs> Yeah. And you were doing um, big baskets of vegetables and things. And there was something called Lysimatia atropurpurea, um, yeah. which I hadn't really seen very much. Um, and you had it in that garden. And I just thought, wow, that is a show-stopping plant. Because, A, because I hadn't seen it, and B, because you'd used quite a lot of it. And I yeah. think um, that was that's something, it's just a Bunny Guinness plant to me. Right, they're probably not um, typical plants that I use a lot though, because what you use for show gardens and, and what I give you perhaps, I wouldn't use so much of the time. I mean, for a lot of the people, when I'm designing for people who aren't great gardeners, but they love their gardens, then I have to be, I have to have much more reliable plants. And um, yeah. clotted cream, is that reliably hardy with you? It's been hardy so far, but then of course last year we didn't have a winter. No. And exactly. Many plants came through last year that wouldn't normally um, in the yeah. garden. And we had we had the most fantastic early show on a an Australian climber called Hardenbergia violacea, which is a conservatory plant and it has racemes. It's a climbing thing, scrambling climbing thing, and it has racemes of tiny bright purple peat pea flowers, um, yeah. and it, it blooms from about January through to the end of March, I suppose. Now that was on a south facing wall outside. It had got too big for me in the greenhouse and I put it outside and sort of thought, well, you know, to do it, do or die. 
and it did. <laughs> and so we were very lucky, but I, I mean, a hard winter would kill it, I think. Plumbago, my Plumbago survived outside last winter. Yeah. And it, you know, it, amazing. I love, I think Plumbago is the best sort of summer bedding plant, if you like, isn't it? I love those big. Providing you don't get too much rain, it's absolutely fantastic, but the rain spoils the flowers. Well, they just drop off a bit, but we've had heavy rain, but mine still look pretty stunkingly great. Yeah, but you could be, you put an umbrella over yours. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think it's the toughest part, and I always, it's so easy for cuttings, don't they? They root in weeks. Sorry, my phone keeps going off with my duck text messaging. <laughs> mm. um, no, well, uh, so and so easy for cuttings, so I always take, as you do of yours, you take yes, standby yes. just in case, and it's so yeah. easy. Yeah. And I love, I we, love we, it. We just, we've just started that time of year where we're taking cuttings furiously now, ready for next year. Um, yeah. And I've, I've got two rather large plants of, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called now. Anyway, I'm, I'm taking masses of cuttings. That's a pest in Australia, but we, it, it, so far it's not hardy here. But I'm going to put oh, the, right. my, two, my two large plants, Lantana Camara, and I'm going to put them in the ground in a sheltered spot and just hope for the best this year. Yeah. You see, some things like camellias, they thought they were tender, didn't they, for years? And then someone left some out. And they find they're totally hardy. But so sometimes I think we, we are delusioning ourselves. Or we are delusioned about the amount of hardness they take. And it takes a bit of trial and error just to see. Yeah, um, there's also the other thing I think, Bunny, and that's, you mentioned me growing a eucomus at the base of a dry hedge, yeah. um, which is totally the wrong place if you read the books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in our, in our meadow, um, but you, I've got to bear, you've got to bear in mind that our water table is 20 feet below the surface. We grow camassias, and I started off with 50 bulbs, and there's got to be 500 bare flowers there today. And, and they always say it likes wet. Yeah, they don't like dry soil. Yeah. 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 Um, and they adapt. But this is why I'm always trying to preach this to people. You know, if you, when we do garden tours and things, and they're, well, how do you grow that? Well, I, I, I try. Um, I don't go mad with preparation or anything but if it does for me it does for me and most plants will adapt to a certain extent mm. Mm. yeah well it's like i've said with my clay it's just i started off being really sad about this horrible heavy clay but now i'm just seeing it as a, a joyful experimentation because it's amazing how many mediterranean plants seem to be perfectly happy and i thought a wet winter mm. was going to kill them but apart from you know, um purple you, sage that's that's you know the that lovely that's the old saying don't incredible. you you know that lovely saying about clay soil, gardeners hate it, but plants love it. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good saying. Yeah. I didn't know that one. Yeah. No. But you just, just walk on. My father made his money from, um, he, he had boiler chickens, and then he, he used the, the shavings and the muck that came out of it, and he made it into a fertiliser, which he sold, and he sold out the business just before he died for quite a large sum of money. And people used to write in saying, this has transformed my clay, but it's organic matter, basically, isn't it? Anything organic onto yeah. clay will just break up and get into those lamellae and help it drain. And you just walk that on, and then you have the most wonderful soil in the world in the end. I think far better than my pre-draining soil, which is a bit of dust on a load of brash, which I add to continually, but it just sinks and soaks it up and it seems to disappear. But yeah, now I'd love to have clay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's doing all right at the moment. Um, just to go back, Bunny, to you were talking about uh, gardeners who maybe aren't great plants people and there are kind of certain good doers that you'll go for. For yeah. anyone who's listening or, or watching this, what would those plants be? Because I can just imagine kind of ears pricking up thinking, oh, what are those, what are those plants? <laughs> Well, I tend to put quite a bit of structure in uh, anyway, but also when you're talking people like who aren't, who haven't got hours and it's not their main passion, then I will do a fair, you know, I'll probably put a structure of uh, uh, evergreen, maybe you or box, uh, maybe like 40, 50 percent. So throughout the year, they're looking at something good. And also because a lot of people's gardens are in easy view of their hags, aren't they? So they're looking every day. They haven't got acres like Alan that they're only going to visit now and then. So it needs to be on show all the time and it needs to look good. And because of the problems with box, I do tend to use dwarf you, well, you instead sometimes for those sort of people who aren't prepared to spray 
um, you know, monthly or whatever, or, or they're not going to use a new cultivar of box. So I was going to come on to those later because they're now, they have now dreaded, haven't they, um, very good resistant varieties which are about to hit the market any time now in England. Um, so maybe box will come back more apart from the moth, of course. So I like a lot of structure. And then to infill it, well, roses, I think good repeat flowering show roses. And one that I've got out in my garden, which I heard Alan recommend on the show years back, it's not the most refined rose, but it's a damn good doer, and that's Pearl Drift. Yes. Isn't it? It's in flower now when all my other repeat flowering roses have not yet gathered up for their second flush. And things like a little white pat, Mary Pavy, for lower whites, or I like a, quite a few roses, but you 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 need to it has to be a decent soil, I think. Bulbs obviously to sprinkle through, and then things like Salvisera Petosi, which I mentioned before, is dead easy and hardy, isn't it? Yep. Um, what else are my good doers? I have to, I should really just poke my head out of the window, but I can't move it around the screen. <laughs> but um, I mean, something like Alchemillamolis is fun, isn't it? And always nice. And if you trim it back after flowering, it looks really sort of good and svelte. Um, those that's are a few that have come to mind. A hydrangea arborescence, Annabelle, is a bit of a cliche there, but my God, it performs. Yes, but so is Verbena venariensis, but then oh, that is yeah. still a plant that looks good, as does Alchemilla mollis, and that's become a cliche plant too. Yeah, and I do yeah. remember about five or six years ago when it was faintly sneered at, but in yeah, the right absolutely. place and treated properly, as you just said, sheared back after flowering, so it doesn't see self continently around the garden. <laughs> Um, yeah. And you're saving yourself lots of work and you get that lovely fresh crop of bright green scallop shaped leaves that hold dewdrops. And yeah, they just no, look so beautiful. Pretty. Really, really beautiful. Um, but I, I'm not a big fan of these massive drifts of perennials that have taken the country by storm over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I mean, when we worked in Japan in Hokkaido, where you have freezing winters, that last right the way up till about April. And then you have like a week of spring and then it's hot. Uh, and the, all the winter it's covered with a meter of snow at least. Uh, then I think masses of perennials are fine. But I think in England, when you get these long wet autumns and springs, masses of perennials just look like a load of wet mush or silage to me. <laughs> and I think they're so boring to garden if it's just masses of perennials. I like, uh, I, I'm not, I haven't really followed that trend at all, I'm afraid. I good. prefer to have more structure and a good mix. But don't you think it's strange? I think they look wonderful on centrefolds when you see these Chelsea gardens as centrefold with masses of perennials. But that's for like a few moments in time, isn't it? Yes, and, I don't And want to through, look from about November, Till the end of May, they're silage, unless we get a hard winter, which is pretty rare. But that's my feeling, anyway. I don't, I'm not mixing my words in any way. But. <laughs> but, uh, and the <laughs> but, other thing um, I think about, about this kind of planting in big drifts, uh, we'll call it prairie planting if you like, but the, the craze for growing echinaceas. Um, and oh. I think if, we, if you look at the RHS trials at Wisley, and you'll see yeah. how many echinaceas have survived the winter, you'll know why people are not planting them anymore. Because they, they keep are saying so these new varieties that are coming out are much better, but I've yet to find one that, yeah, that, that does too. survive. I I'm think there are big money spinners on echinaceas that don't do it. Don't don't do it. Yeah, I am. They're a big money spinner, aren't they? Because people yes. replace them year after year, thinking they're doing it wrong. But it's the plant. I uh, I find <laughs> echinaceas are a little bit like hangovers, um, where I tend to have the same make the same mistake sort of once every like three or four years you know I'll 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 be quite well behaved and I won't buy any echinaceas in the same way that I'll remember what gives me a hangover and then every three or four years I'll have a blip oh, right. and I'll succumb to an echinacea you fall that off I know the wagon. is going to die <laughs> <laughs> now I'm I'm not a fan of heucheras either that's another popular plant but I'm afraid I'm just heuchered out well, I think uh, because, because there's, there's so, so many, many new varieties every year. Ever more garish. Forward. Yeah, exactly. And I do think a lot of the new varieties are done for money spinning, aren't they? Yes, and of they give they them are. tremendous hype. And we rush out and buy two them. lovely little lady gardeners in the garden a few days ago looking at heucheras, which we have for sale on the plant stand. And one yeah. turned to the other and said, Oh, look, we haven't got these two, have we? And it, <sighs> just imagine they, they, have, they have a border like a stamp collection. But and yeah. it just looks so boring. But I mean, you yeah. know, to each their of their own, I suppose. 
My, my name for Eucharist, which is totally controversial, is Pucarus. But, <laughs> but there we are. Some are that I'm colour. sure you've got some beautiful ones, though, <laughs> that I haven't yet discovered. <laughs> one of my favourites, I have to say, there is one that I do like, and it's a red flower variety with brown leaves called Paris. Right. I do think that that After Paris Hilton. I will no, no. I, maybe. Yes. Who knows? Sounds like so it. you think I should buy that? I think it's a very good plant. It flowers quite early. It, it does end of April through to the beginning or middle of June, and it flowers well. Then you've got to deadhead right. it and, and just, you know, fuss it up a little bit, and it remains yeah. nice for the rest of the season. And sometimes it will flush up again in the autumn with some lovely little um, pops of a red colour. And red one thing I'm not sure about heuchras is you cannot divide them, can you? That's yes, right, you can. they don't divide. Oh, you can, because yes, some can. people say you, can, you can't. You you, you, what you ha the, no, you can't divide them with a root, Bunny, I think. That's what happens. Ah. But you get this kind of stem, which is rather like a cordex. And if you yes. pull them apart and cut the base of that stem, leave it to dry, and then pot them individually into something like seven centimetre pots in a gritty mix, they will root. Right, so because I don't grow them, I've never done that, but I've heard that, and so I wondered how you yeah. propagate them. Not that I wanted to, but yes, I was interested. Well, we've, right. we've, we've sometimes had the dreaded vine weevil because they are, oh. um, they're on the, the vine weevil's top menu list, you know, and, and yeah. when you get that, you pull the crown apart and recut the bases of the stems and off you go again. Talk of hookahs mm. may well have given people some FLOMO, fear of missing out on a fabulous plant. I'm going to go first because I always pick something that everyone else is growing um, because I've got the smallest garden, I'm the newest gardener. Um, it's something actually I spotted on Twitter. Uh, Chris Young, the editor of um, the RHS, The Garden Magazine, had been to Keith Wiley's Wild Side down in Devon and um, I've never been and I really must go. And it was a photo, and I'm going to say it wrong, but uh, I think it was a Roscoea. Um, there we go. Possibly yeah. royal purple or a family jewels hybrid or something, but it was just this fabulous sort of cerisi, purpley, ready mix, all the colours that I end up going for, all these jewel colours that I love. Um, and I just thought, wow, I need that in my life. It wasn't red Gurkha, was it? <laughs> Could have been. It, it wasn't labelled. So I was sort of been mm -hmm. looking online trying to figure out what it was. Well, there's an awful lot of breeding work been done on them in recent years. Um, and they are quite an interesting plant, but they don't flower for a huge length of time. Um, they look a little bit gingerish, don't they, as well, their foliage. Yes. Um, yeah. And they're quite nice because they will grow in, in part shade, which is all, always very good. But they like moisture, don't they? Isn't that right? So I think I've tried them many moons ago, and I think yeah, I lost... I think, I think unless you match, actually, if you've got a dry saw like you have and I have, I think we're going to have to work in loads of organic matter and make sure that they ha they ha they're watered for times because they won't yeah. stand drought. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I can't really. I've given up with those sort of things a bit because I just don't but have I'm, manpower. I'm... <laughs> One day a week, me. Yeah, but I'm I'm actually trying. I have a little, well. I have a few more days in the garden than you do, Bunny, because I don't have this flourishing design business. But what mm. I'm trying to do is I'm trying to experiment with leaky pipe on various flower beds. Um, yeah, leaky pipe is a superb way of applying moisture to the ground because it doesn't evaporate, doesn't knock things over, and you can leave it on overnight, and it permeates very slowly right down to the roots where it's needed. And once it gets down there, you know you don't need to water for another seven to ten days. Yeah, no, I have that in certain areas. You mean the one with pressure drip emitters? Because you can get the leaky pipe that you get from a garden centre, oh, that's horrid. The retail market, which yeah. has sends out gallons at one end and nothing at the other. Yeah, and it also one, I think you hard water. has little drip emitters throughout it that are pressurised. Yeah. And it just, so you get the same amount of water out at one end as you do at the other end. Exactly. That's and I really just mean. lay them on the soil and they're about 60 centimetres apart, the pipe. And that's interesting because that's how far the water will move across the soil. You don't need yeah. a huge concentration of them. And I, I work my manually, so I just put it on for about two hours a week when it's very dry. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I don't bother because I basically want the plants to get their roots down and be on their own two feet. And I was really yeah. anti-irrigation because of that, because we don't have mains water. I used to reuse the water from our hot water bottles. That's how nervous I am about our water supply when it's dry. But then one, a guy that I use on lots of jobs said, I'm going to put one in for you, Barney. This is ridiculous. And he insisted on it. And I have to say, I've been a convert ever since. 
Um, it is amazing the type you're talking about, but you do, if you dig in your borders, you have to be very careful because you can slice through those pipes and you need to check them regularly that you haven't just nicked it or something hasn't eaten a bit of it and it leaks. Uh, so you need to just check. Like, I was talking me. to deep down nurseries and they go send someone around every week to check that irrigation. Which reminds me because I've got, uh, and I hope he's listening because he's sitting next to across the room. But Graham, I have to tell you, there is a flood down near the kiosk this morning because one of the leaky pipes has burst. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you see. For me, that would be awful because I think, well, I have no water in the bath because it's all flooded in the garden. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, yeah, I think I think with our climate, you're probably right, and it's a, a, a very inextravagant way to use it. Yeah. So, Bunny, what would be your was, flomo? My flomo, it would be one of these. Well, I've tried to get them one of these new um, blight resistant box varieties, which Didier Hermans. Do you know Didier Hermans? I've heard of and him. And I yeah. think he calls them Better Boxes dot com and he's he's read for there's renaissance which he reckons is the best one if you're doing what he calls parterre de broidery in other words low box hedges that's what they called it don't they broidery broidery which is much nicer than what we call it um and so there's renaissance skylight which is a good one for balls because it's a bit more vigorous babylon beauty um and heritage so it's got four but he's been very clever with his marketing because he's just released them to the, like four top gardens in Bar France. Like, I think it's something like Versailles, somewhere else and somewhere else, because he calls them ambassadors. So he doesn't want to all and sundry to buy them because he thinks they won't tend them properly. They might succumb to the moth and then he'll get the backlash. I imagine that's why he's doing it anyway. So he's looking for ambassadors and I'm saying, I'm going to be an ambassador. You know, can I buy some plants and have some plants? And so I'm going to try it um and see because i i do get bits of blight and i just keep it under control with with spray which is simple but i'd rather not have to um do that really i'd rather it was healthy but i mean the other thing obviously is um you for dwarf hedging my uncle in his rose gardens had you for about 12 and he keeps it about a foot high and it's fabulous uh, you done, know it's we've really done good that. we've done that with a couple of um, beds outside our uh, the, the garden front of the house at the top of the steps so we had box there which was very blighted and um, we haven't had the box moth caterpillar at the moment in the garden at all um, but we have had quite a lot of box and I replaced that box there with you which we keep at between 30 to 45 centimeters and it works very very well the other thing that I've found is a dwarf euonymus which is not yeah I've tried that yeah, which one have you, have you tried it's Benno something or other Benno Kamiki or Benno something oh. It looks more like a anonymous than a box, though, doesn't it? Don't you think? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But I mean, it, this is not, I, I have to tell people all the time, you know, you're not looking at a box replica. You are looking at an entirely different plant, but it serves the same purpose because it's, it's beautifully um, dark green. It's got small leaves. It's not box, but you can treat it as box and it will do the same job. I think they've got that one at Hidcote, was it? I saw they planted a load of that. Have they? Yeah. But, yeah, but what, so what do you use to spray yours then? Do you use Signum top boxes. and, and um, Top Boxes? Yeah, Top Boxes. You, not Signum? No. Right, and you find that works? It does work, yes. Um, and we, we've got a series of, I think, something like 18 box balls either side of, a, of, of an entrance. Um, and they were, I mean, it was yeah. a design thing that we did because we had some plants that were left over. So we just kept them as balls and planted them in rows and they get it um, regularly. But um, I mean, if you looked at them now, you wouldn't yeah. know that they'd had it. But last year they had great dead patches on them. Um, but, but I, like you, would yeah. rather not yeah. have to spray because it's another job to fit into what is an, pain, already, isn't an already busy schedule. Exactly. So I feel a spot of Alan Gray flomo coming on. Oh, well. Well, I was, I'll tell you what I was reading, and this is a, a lovely thing to have from the RHS. It's called the Plant Review. 
Um, and, you know, you've got wonderful people like Roy Lancaster uh, suggesting lovely plants. My one gripe about this is but you very rarely can find them easily. You have to go on a detective um, hunt to get them. But there is a Mahonia that he's been writing about. And I was thought, thought of this when you were talking about your structure uh, bunny in various gardens that you put in. Mm. Um, so there's something good to look at uh, all of the year. And this Mahonia Hartwigii. It's a striking ornamental with blue-gray foliage and large panicles of flowers, but the flowers are white and yellow, it's kind of lemony yellow, and they're in quite large oh. panicles that flow from the central um, point of the of the plant. And the it's very vicious. That's the only thing I would say. <laughs> it's not the kind of plant that you want to sort of be messing around underneath because you get pricks all over the place. Um, but it is a very nice looking plant. And I did just think that that is something I would like to have in the garden here. We've got quite a few yeah. Mahonias and they are yeah. jolly useful plants. The one thing about Mahonias is that people don't prune them and they should because it makes them into much more usable garden plants. Otherwise they get too tall and leggy, you think? And yes, they get, they, they get yeah. bare bottoms and that's not a good look. Yeah, also well, some of the Lomnifolias I've seen with bare bottom. Look oh, they look quite characterful. Yeah, then they become yes. wonderful, yeah. Yes, because they've got that corky, very ribbed bark. Yeah. Um, and that takes on a character of its own. It's almost, um, it's quite eerie. It's almost hauntingly beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, I cannot believe where the time has gone. We've only got a couple of minutes left. And I, we really should fit in one question that I sent you a photo, Alan, that Richard yep. had uh, got in touch about the leaf on his pear, which was dotted with these bright orange spots. What's causing it and what can he do? Well, it's pear rust, and the strange thing is that pear rust affects pears and junipers. Now, I'd just like to know whether this, this, um, the asker of this question has any junipers growing in his garden, because if he has, um, the rust is going to flip between the two, and they, they, it, it, it will exacerbate the problem. So you either stop growing junipers or you stop growing pears. Um, it, it, there's nothing very much that you can spray on it to get rid of it. You could try a fungicide if you like, but I mean, I don't think that sprays of any kind mixed with food that's edible, I wouldn't want to risk that. Um, but you can pick some of the leaves off, but I mean, if you've got an extensive tree or um, plant that you've got an awful lot of leaves on, you don't probably want to relish doing that either. I'm a great one for, if I, if I have a plant, especially that get Fung fungus of any kind, a fungus infection, uh, infection of any kind. Um, I'm a great person for taking that plant out of the garden, destroying it and not growing it for at least five years. You prune it with a spade, as they say. Yes, yeah, prune it with a spade. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, we have this, we have a, um, a, another classic case is antirrhinum rust. Um, don't grow antirrhinums for about three to five years if you've got it, then it will, it will dissipate. The same thing can be said for downy mildew on Nicotianas, if that happens to you, don't grow them for a few years um, and, and hopefully the, the fun fungus will disappear. If it hasn't got anything to grow on, it will probably disappear in three to five years. Well, if you have got a question, we always seem to run out of time, but we try and fit one or two in. You can email hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk or comment below any of our podcasts on YouTube. But we've run out of time. I don't know where it goes, but that was a, a riot of, of plants and beautiful, inspiring garden chat. So thank you both for your time. Thank well, you. Thank you. It's <laughs> lovely to see you both and chat with you. Have a good gardening week. Yes. Happy gardening. Happy gardening, Bye. everybody. Hey. I could just put a bit of paper in my face. <laughs> what about that? I quite like that. Yes. Um, it's nicer without headphones. You feel yeah. like something from outer space. Yeah. You look like a Sputnik, I think, with, with headphones. <laughs> don't you, really, if that's the right word. <laughs> Can I hear Alan? Because he's being a bit mute. And he's never known no, him. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> <kidding. laughs> Sorry. I never thought you were ever mute, and I just thought maybe you couldn't hear us. No, no, no I can hear every word. He's oh, more mute when I'm around because I talk so much, so. Oh, right. Gosh. <laughs>